Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, attending my seminar. Uh, my name is Spencer Parker. I'm Group Product Manager at WebSense for WebSense's cloud business. Uh, and today we're going to talk uh, about how in a mobile space can you really secure devices and data uh, in a way that uh, before you haven't been able to do. And when we look at the mobile enterprise today, there's a whole slew of different ways we have to think about it and, and come at security. From the types of devices, you know, the, from the laptop days, you know, we've fairly, we know fairly well how to secure a laptop when it's out in the field now, we, whether we, we're using VPNs, remote services, uh, Citrix, um, you know, virtual desktops, those types of things, very simple to do um, and inherently, you know, pretty well defined. But as smart devices, the, the iPads, the iPhones, the other Android type devices have become more prevalent, uh, and especially the bring your own devices, uh, we're having to take a new look at the way that we, we do security for those devices because they inherently don't make it easy for you to do this. We have to look at the methods of access, you know, how are people getting to the, their corporate information and assets, whether it be on the LAN, uh, on the Wi-Fi, whether it be on a public Wi-Fi, uh, whether it be on 3G, 4G type networks. So the methods of access become very key as well because again these devices typically do not set up uh, security on, on each network independently. They're very network centric in, in terms of the types of settings that you have to put on them. We also have to be aware of the data on these devices as well. So where these smart devices are concerned, even when they're corporate owned, there's a very big blurring between you know, what data is corporate and what data is personal on these devices. You know, we give people iPhones, but they may well be using their camera for their own personal pictures. It may be against corporate policy to do so, but they do. You know, it's, it's, people don't like carrying multiple devices and phones and things like that with them. So, um, you know, people do start to take a little bit of a liberty with, with, with those devices. The storage options as well have to be taken into account. Uh, iPhones and iPads in particular make storage an interesting challenge because of the way that their applications sandbox everything. So it's very difficult to share one application from another application and if you do work on things like um, you know, office type documents on these, how do I then take that work that I've saved and move it elsewhere? It's not easy to do so. So the way that they've enabled it is through cloud services whether it be something like Dropbox or Box.net or iCloud or something like that, um, inherent, the cloud is inherent there in the, in the way that storage works on these devices. And the apps used as well are, are, are very different. You know, there are very distinct business applications, there are very distinct consumer applications. I, I cannot think of a single you know, business use of Angry Birds yet. We've, we've tried, but we, we haven't found one. Um, and there's a, the, the only area where those two things blur is really in the web browser whether that be Safari or whatever other, um, or Chrome for Android now, or, or those types of things, that, that is really the only place where the apps really blur. So with those taken into account, what you're essentially trying to do with these devices is create your empowered users. Those people out there that really want to be able to do their job, they want to be able to do it anywhere, anytime, um, take their work home with them, work on the train, all these various bits and pieces. And it's a, it's a great place to be because of the way, you know, our so-called nine to five jobs have changed into, uh, you know, ruling our lives. And the way that these devices live in the cloud inherently, you know, makes things like SaaS applications a very good idea for them. Because with, with the data living in the cloud and the device living in the cloud, it makes things much easier to manage. But a fundamental shift in security is needed. So if you look at the types of network breaches that have been there over the last uh, few years, this is a, a Ponemon Institute um, survey that was done last year with Juniper. Uh, so 10% of the 4,500 companies surveyed claim they'd had no data breaches in that year. I'm always a bit sceptical of that number. I mean, a lot of people will say, no, we didn't have any data breaches because they don't like to admit it. There's also that portion of people that probably has no detection capabilities whatsoever, so they had no idea whether they had a data breach or not. 21% have one um, bad data breach. 59% of those companies had two to five bad data breaches in that year. That's a huge percentage. And when you look at where those uh, percentages lie, uh, insider abuse is the obvious one. The people that already have access to that data makes it easy to remove that data. I, I've never quite got Ponemon's two, the next two down. Malicious software downloads and, mal and malware from a website, aren't they the same thing? 
Um, but those two uh, have been uh, you know, pretty prevalent. You know, the web is the major source of malware today. Um, it's no longer email. Email typically uses the, the psycho psychological aspect to get you to click on a link in the email, which then delivers you the actual piece of malware. It's quite rare to actually have malware as an attachment now. Sometimes you have some, some PDFs and things like that that may be infected, but on the whole, it's really the email itself is the psychological aspect to get you to click on the link. So social media is, is rapidly rising in terms of the, the, the web exposure there. How many people here allow, allow their users to go to Facebook? So every time I do this, it gets more and more people. I mean, businesses have their own pages now. They're demanding access to, to these types of sites. So it's, it's interesting that you know, social media is being accepted by companies, but it comes with its own security risks that we need to be able to deal with. And when you look at the, the, the types of companies out there that have been, had, had some pretty major data breaches, now this is all publicly available data, I'm not sort of uh, breaking any uh, rules here, but Heartland Payment Systems in the US, the most had 130 million records hacked. You know, Sony Corporation with the Sony uh, PlayStation Network hack, 77 million records hacked. There's a lot of very high profile uh, companies there that have lost a lot of data. And because of that, we need to, you know, be able to secure that data the best way that we can. And why is a lot of this data sort of finding its way out of the network? Well, malware is one of the obvious ways here. Uh, and the way that malware has changed in the last few years, um, sort of this, this graph really sort of represents that. So WebSense has the, the sort of leading web security uh, platform out there. And we take the data that we see every day from our customers and we run it against the top five AV engines out there to work out what the true zero day attacks were. Uh, and in 2008, the average number of zero-day attacks, uh, unique samples that we saw was 153. So, you know, not a huge amount in comparison, but if you look at last year, 641 a day, it suddenly, you start, start to see how all of these pieces of malware now are beginning to become almost malware as a service. They are morphing almost on every download now for customers, re-obfuscating themselves, doing those things that they do to get around the standard AV defenses, which may be standard sort of regular expression type matching or, or hash matching of a file. And if, if you have no sort of advanced detection capabilities to actually investigate the code itself, you're not going to find these things. And we, we did a survey last year of UK companies to about two and a half thousand. Uh, and we asked, you know, what were your best security solutions? Uh, and the antivirus products, your desktop AV came there at the top at 24%, firewalls at 21%. I mean, to me, what this says is there is no one thing that solves the malware problem. There's a huge number of things, and strength and depth is key. You do still have to have antivirus on the desktop. There are many more ways than just email and web to get viruses onto, onto machines. You have to, of course, have firewalls to, to make... Uh, to start to sort of limit the ports and, and limit the access to the network. But there's all sorts of other things here that you need uh, to have that strength in depth to give you as, as best a, a security stance as possible against the malware coming in. And the trends that we're seeing uh, for this year um, is that, first of all, the externalization of the IT infrastructure. We're seeing a lot more companies looking at private clouds, uh, for, you know, whether it be Amazon's EC2, Rackspace, those fast host, those types of companies, uh, VMware's, vCloud, uh, that offer the ability to do the externalization of your IT infrastructure. And a lot of times it makes a lot of sense to do it, especially if you have short-term projects. If you have to go and deploy a lot of kit, and you want to, and that kit to depreciate over three to five years, that's all well and good. But if you've got a project that may only last six months, things like the cloud do make a lot of sense. You buy it by CPU. You buy it by the, the amount you actually use. And if you're a, a six-month project, will often come in a lot cheaper if you use that. But of course, it comes with its whole slew of um, security in infrastructure that needs to be placed around it so that you're happy that that data is as secure on the private cloud as it is on your own network. The consumerization and virtualization of the endpoint is, is <laughs> happening at a pace. How many people here allow, allow your staff with their own BYODs to access their email through Exchange, like through ActiveSync? Again, quite a few now. At that minute, that data is on that person's device. How do you know where it's going next? And that's one of the things we're going to cover today. Windows 8 is out this year, supposedly with a huge leap forward in security. Well, it's the first rewrite of Windows since Windows 95. I think I may be waiting for at least Service Pack 2 before I make that decision. 
Uh, business enablement via the social web is, is again happening apace. Um, if you don't have your own company Facebook page yet, somebody's probably already set it up for you and is masquerading themselves as you. So I would recommend that you get uh, that at least placeholder in place as soon as possible. The security consolidation is continuing apace out there. There's companies being uh, acquired all the time. UTMs are becoming much more powerful now to do multiple uh, different things at the edge of your network. And as every year, the, the data-orientated attacks are becoming an everyday event for most customers now. So hopefully you've, you've got them stopped. Um, and if you don't stop them on the way in, hopefully you're stopping them on the way out because containment is almost as important uh, as you know, blocking and detection. Because if you can contain something on the way out, it's much less of a risk than if, you know, and you know you've got a problem, you can go and deal with it. Then the start, if you can't contain it, where well, you never even know you've got that problem uh, until it's too late. So let's switch now to mobiles and smart devices. And the key thing here is that really the most important thing about the, the, you know, these you know, types of devices is the security needs to be about the data itself, not the device particularly. The device is fairly simple to lock down in, in, in certain key ways through an MDM service. But it's really the data on this device that can harm you. If one of these phones gets lost, OK, it's an insurance claim for 500 pounds. It's not the end of the world, but the, the data that was on it may be worth millions. In the, uh, you just don't know until that device is gone what the problem is going to be. But there are various challenges to secure that data, not least the fact that these are very closed operating systems. So it's very, very difficult to actually put an agent on this device. In fact, it's almost, it is impossible to put an agent on this device that can see into every application. You can't do it. You could have a sandboxed application that does web and mail, for instance, but then you're limiting those users to the user experience of that one app. And if that app's user experience isn't particularly good, then you know, you, you're losing a lot of what is great about these phones. So you know, and it's one of the things that always comes up when I do this presentation is afterwards, people will say to me, why didn't you talk about BlackBerry? Why is it always so Androids and, uh, and iPhones? Well, the reality is, Blackberries for a very, very long time have done enterprise security very well. But if you ask an end user if they want a Blackberry or an iPhone, I think we all know what the answer is, which is why we're having to deal with them right now. So as I say, the challenges with these things is that often these devices are not owned by the company. So how much security can I put on these? Can I enroll them in an MDM service? Will the end user allow me to do a remote wipe of his entire phone? And you have to be very careful on that from a legal standpoint as well. There's already been a couple of successful cases in the US where somebody had a BYOD. They came in, the company said, great, yes, you can have your email, but when you leave the company, we will remote wipe that phone. They didn't realize that the remote wipe was not just the email, and it wiped all of the pictures. A lot of family pictures that the guy hadn't taken off his phone. And he sued successfully the company for wiping those pictures off. And it was a, a Hawaiian holiday, and they had to pay for him and his family to go on holiday again so he could do the pictures again. So it's, it, it, you do get in these sort of bizarre situations with the law. So your policy has to be unbelievably clear for BYODs about what you can and what you can't do with these devices. Again, you're probably not even gonna own the pipe on these devices. As I say, most of these things live in the cloud, 3G, 4G now, and you have no control there. You can't see that traffic. So again, it becomes a problem there. And they inherently live outside of your network. So you, know, you may well be blocking Facebook, but if somebody's got 3G access in your office, they can still surf away on these things for, with Facebook. Of course, that's a, not a security issue at that point. That's a productivity issue, and that should be dealt with the management of that, the manager of that, that person, not the security managers. And we always have that really gray area where wherever monitoring is concerned about you know, what is a security issue and should the security people deal with, and what is a productivity issue and the, the, the managers should deal with. But the primary risk is how do I secure the data on these devices? So A, if the device is lost, or if the employee leaves the company. So we need to be able to prevent data leakage to unauthorized destinations or recipients very carefully on these things. And to give you some examples here of the data risk that we have. So one of the things here, if you open, if you install the Dropbox app on here, and then I can download a PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, the PowerPoint viewer has this little open in Dropbox button now put in the top, 
All I've got to do is click that one button and that PowerPoint has now uploaded to Dropbox. It is now out of my control. Again, I mean, WebSense, very SaaS friendly company. We use Salesforce. We put all of our competitive information in that Salesforce portal for our staff. Very easy to go in through the web browser, download all of that information. But where is it going afterwards? And of course, the, the, the mail side of things, you know, confidential information flying around like you wouldn't believe on these things. So we need not only a device-centric approach to the security of mail on those devices, but also a geolocation approach as well. So what are the shortcomings of the current ways that we would try and achieve this out there? Well, probably the most basic common denominator is Active Sync. Um, you know, it's, a lot of people's exchanges have that installed now, uh, and that is the secure way of getting mail onto these devices. We no longer look at IMAP or POP3 in any seriousness at all anymore. So Active Sync's there, it uses HTTPS for its transport protocol, um, so we, we have a nice secure pipe, but once that data is on the phone, we have no data leakage prevention or threat protection at all from where that data is going to go. So it provides only very basic controls to access Exchange, password enforcement and you know, remote wipe, but that's it. Let's look at option two. Backhauling traffic over a VPN. So you can get uh, always on VPNs for these devices. Um, you can backhaul all the traffic in and out of your network, go through whatever data in motion detection capabilities that you have. Um, it's not bad. Uh, it's not a bad approach to, to do it, as long as you've got that infrastructure in place. You know, do you have full DLP? Do you have full web security, full email security? All of those bits and pieces that you need to have. But the reality as well is that you're going to slow data access down on these devices quite substantially because you're, you're essentially got to haul that all the way back to your network and then back out again and then back to the network and back to the phone. So it really delays a lot of the traffic. Admittedly, people don't yet expect a fast browsing service on their phone, so you get away with it a little bit. But as networks become faster, we're getting away with less. The other thing is, has anybody here tried running and always on VPN on one of these phones with full encryption turned on? Watch that 20% of that battery life just disappear. And anyone that uses these knows that 20% of battery on these is a precious thing. You'd like that battery to at least last one day. And use 20% of this, no way is that lasting a day. Third approach, which is a really interesting approach to take, is tablet as a terminal. So. The ability to use something like Citrix or, or one of those types of clients to actually have all of the applications on a terminal server, and therefore the data never truly resides on that remote device. It's a very good way of doing it. You can't stop, for instance, screen share, you know, you know, doing the screen captures, for instance, and things like that. So there is still potential for data leakage. But as a whole, it's actually a really, really good way of securing those, those devices. Now, you know, at that point, you know, the device itself really is only you know, it's device management rather than data management. But it's very expensive to do, uh, and it won't work with every application. And anybody who's tried running a Windows desktop on one of these things, it's an interesting experience. It's getting better, but the, you know, and, and when Windows 8 comes out with its touch interface, it's going to become a lot better. But at the moment, it is um, a high learning curve, which I certainly wouldn't want to give everybody in an organization, um, because they will find it quite difficult in certain situations. And the fourth option is MDM, mobile device management. So these solutions um, for Apple devices, it's all through Apple's own MDM uh, API, uh, give you a nice pre-format of what I can do, what I can switch off, you know, do I allow no YouTube access, do I you know, turn off the YouTube app, do I turn off the Safari, what apps can be installed, all of those types of things. Again, nice solution in terms of the device does absolutely no data security whatsoever, but at least it's a nice type of solution. And it's certainly necessary, but it is absolutely only a small part of what we're trying to achieve with these. So what are, what are WebSense doing? So with our Triton Mobile Security product, we try to take a best of breed approach uh, to a lot of these things. So we understand that it is all about the data. So first of all, uh, we are a full MDM solution in the cloud because ultimately I need to control this phone and I need to control this phone for one particular reason and that is I need an always-on VPN. Now, what I don't want to do is have an always-on VPN with encryption because it's encryption that actually burns through the battery. 
What I want to be able to do is encapsulate the data up to WebSense's cloud. And with that encapsulation, then in the cloud, do all of the DLP and the web and the mail security scanning. Because that's 99% of the data that comes on and off these devices is HTTP and email. So with that in mind, as if we have all of that technology as a SaaS service up in the cloud, and these devices live in the cloud, it makes it a lot, lot more interesting. So we need to be able to do full data leakage and data theft prevention. We need to be able to say, if you are opening uh, you know, or uploading something to Dropbox, can I do DLP against that, that actual file itself to see whether it's confidential or not? And then if it is, what Dropbox account are you uploading it to? Are you uploading it to your own personal account or are you uploading it to a Dropbox Enterprise account we've given you? So we need to have that level of distinction. Same with Box.net and iCloud and uh, Google's new storage solution, that, which is out in the US now and coming out into Europe very shortly. So we need to be able to control that. We need to be able to do malware protection. And I'm going to come on in a lot more detail in, in how we detect malware on these things in, in a moment. But suffice to say, Apple have actually done a pretty good job at keeping these things clean. I mean, if you jailbreak these devices, all bets are off. Uh, but Android absolutely is the wild west of the internet. And Again, we'll go through that in a little bit more detail. We need to do mobile app categorization as well. Because these, these applications talk HTTP, we need to make sure that we can allow the right URLs and not have strange categorizations for certain things in the background that you wouldn't expect. We need that all through an integrated policy, so you can have exactly the same policy as your on-premise, um, maybe WebSense box up in the cloud. And so if I'm blocked from going to gambling sites on the cloud, I need to be able to block people going to gambling sites on these, if it is a corporate owned device. Because the key here is we need different profiles, not by user, but by the type of device as well. Because if it's a bring your own device of an end user, first things first, I actually legally do not want to log where they're going on these phones. Because that's private information. Don't want to log that. I want to block all the security categories so they don't get infected. But if they happen to want to go to something a little bit naughty at 8 o'clock in the evening in the privacy of their own home, who are we to judge? It's their own device. If obviously, if it's a corporate device, hell no. But we need that level of capability to have different policies based upon whether it's corporate owned or not. And we've just released, actually, a couple of weeks ago now, uh, a new Ponemon report that we sponsored. With, again, about 4,500 companies worldwide uh, answered this, and we did a, 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 this global study on mobility risks. And we had some sort of interesting headlines about it. You can download this for free from WebSense's website. 77% agree that employee use of mobile devices are now essential or very important to their organization's ability to meet business objectives. Okay, yeah, these, we know these things are useful. Okay, I was actually surprised it was as, not, as, not higher than 77%. But 76% of those people realized that these tools actually put their organizations at risk. As security people, it's always about risk against cost, isn't it? You know, how much money have I got to spend to make my you know, network and my people as secure as I possibly can? So it's, a, you know, it's always that sort of balancing act of how secure can I get with the budgets that are available to me and the policies that I can create. 51% of people experience data loss because of unsecured mobile devices. That's half of the, the, the four and a half thousand companies said that they experienced that data loss. And 59% of those companies saw an increase in, mobile, in malware infections because of these devices on their network. 59, that's again, a huge portion. So these clearly have a massive risk associated with them. And we risk people. So why are we even considering these things? It's because our end users are demanding it. And not only are our end users demanding it, how many people here, when one of these things first came out a few years ago, the first person who asked for network access was, was someone at sea level? Yep. You come in on the Monday morning, the guy's got his iPad, he's walked in, I want all my apps on that tomorrow, please. We all sit there and just go, oh no, it's happening. And of course, when it starts at that level, it goes down through the business. So you can bet that you're going to have to deal with these things as well. And of course, the sea level people are probably the people that you need the most protection for, because they're the people that have the access to the most amount of data uh, that could harm your business if it was lost. So you've got to be able to, to, to secure those people and let them sit in Mauritius by the pool with their iPad, you know, getting on with the financial results. 
So let's now change tact a little bit and actually look at how we find malware. And this is particularly around Android. So in the last three years, I believe there's been eight pieces of malware on the Apple App Store. Eight out of half a million published apps. That's not a bad record, really. And Apple have got them down very quickly when they found them. Android, on the other hand, is a whole nother matter. So we've um, done a lot of Android app analysis, and I'm going to show you how we do that now. But uh, some of the headline figures here, uh, we've downloaded something in the region of about 200,000 pieces of Android um, software now, um, of which over 20% is malware. 20%. That doesn't mean everything on the Google Play Store is that. It's because you can sideload from all these other grey market stores that most of the problems happen. And what we term as malicious might not just be data stealing malware, it could be you know, sending SMS messages to premium rate phone lines at the background. Uh, and again, we'll do that a little bit more sort of information. So what we've noticed is there's little or no approval process for most of these apps. Again, Google are, are improving this greatly. Uh, they've just released the, the Google Play Store that now has uh, some new Defender uh, technology in it to make sure that a lot of this malware doesn't get into their stores. But that's not the only store. There are grey market stores out there. There are authorised stores out there, like Amazon's App Store, for instance. How do you secure all of that data? When you can, you can just tick one box and sideload it from anywhere you like as well. So there are now more Android apps than there are on Apple with a much higher growth rate. But there's also a much higher percentage of rooted phones out there, which can then accept any data uh, onto them. Uh, you know, jailbreaking one of these things is not that, you don't see it that often you know, in a corporate environment. Rooted Android phones on another matter you know, is a whole other matter. Some of them don't allow you to root them, but most of them do. You know, in fact, if you look at the ice cream sandwich release for most uh, the HTC phones, there's a little box, do you want this rooted? You know, there's been a lot of law, lawsuits in the U US again, where it's like, how dare you lock our phone? We own this phone. We should decide what we put on it. So they've had to make it very easy for you to unlock it and make it rooted. And because of that, the moment that device is rooted, it's like running everything, you know, as an admin on a PC. It's, it's very then simple to get more malware onto these things. So as a company, what do we do? To, do we be reactive, we wait for samples and we analyze them as our customers download them? Or do we go proactive? Do we go out there and do we start downloading everything we can find through every gray market app store that we can find? And that's absolutely the way that we went. Because we're interested in these five things. So we can build up a picture of an Android app from who they are, what's it trying to do, where is it situated in which app store, how is it trying to do something and when is it trying to do something? So building up these five key things gives us a very good level of confidence score when something is malware. And we have a, 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 an app analyzer that we've developed internally. We're actually going to make this externally available through an Android app very shortly. So you can, every APK file that you download you'll be, for free, you'll be able to scan it through here. Um, it will show you what permissions it's got, what the hash file of it, uh, the, of the file download is, what's it trying to do, all of these various different bits and pieces. And we, we can even show you all of the various embedded files. And, and this is actually sometimes where you start to see some very, very interesting things. So sometimes you'll see a little file called sms.txt. Uh, and this will be a list of country codes with SMS um, premium rate numbers in it, for instance. So once it detects what country you're in, it knows what um, premium rate you know, phone number to, to, to message to at £4.50 a pop or however much it is. Uh, and we also then look at the authors of these apps as well. You know, there's a, there's a guy here called Alan who 84 malicious files uh, created there. Obviously, somebody called Alan is a bit dodgy. Um, phone Sniper there is a, another malicious one. Android, ooh, somebody called Android does 148 malicious apps, but also 9,500 completely normal apps as well. So there's a, there's a lot of sort of information contained in these things because one of the ways again that we see people trying to get around these types of things is that they'll publish an APK file to one of these, these app stores and they, they may publish six more variants in the same day and just keep you know 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1. really really quickly cycling through you know these various versions 
so it never gets blocked in an app store because there's always some lag in the time that these things have been analyzed and then removed. And if they're ahead of that lag time, we're just updating more and more versions. And all they've done is change one piece of little tiny code to get a new hash within that file. Very, very simple to do. Never ever you, do you ever see this in you know, a perfectly legitimate application. So if we see an app you know, really ramp, ramping up very quickly the version numbers, again, we know it's malicious. It's being done like that to actually get around the security. So there's lots of fake installers out there. Um, it looks like a standard app, but the, the actual installer itself is actually putting other things on there. It allows you to you know, make rogue AV applications very simply, for instance, um, because you're giving them a screen that looks like something and it's not. It's completely fake. But once it's on there, it can sideload other things on, do other things that are, are very malicious. And I mentioned here that um, when we actually look into these APK files, and APK files are the, the Android installer file, it's easily exploded out so we can see all the various things here. I know this is going to be very difficult to see here, but these are all of the country codes here that we're seeing uh, for the SMS side of things. Um, you can also target these attacks very clearly to specific countries by only being malicious in certain countries and all of those types of things that we see. I mean, we're seeing um, you know, some very specific Russian code for Russian people, for instance. We also, you know, you typically find a lot of the Chinese-based malware doesn't attack people in China. It attacks everywhere else, but not in, actually in China. So. Um, and then what we're also seeing is that it's sideloading here from moyandroid.net something else. And that when you actually look at moyandroid.net, you know, it looks like a, a fairly legitimate type of app store. Uh, I'm not quite sure the use of what Chainsaw Bunny version 1.0 is. Uh, clearly an interesting looking game there. But, um, you know, nice professional graphics, looks great, you know, looks legitimate. They use, again, all of the techniques um, that advertising agencies use from a psychological perspective to get you to believe this thing. You know, it looks real. It's got lots of nice reviews on it. All those things that are so easy to create yourselves. <coughs> TripAdvisor. And um, it's very, very professionally done. But everything that you download from this website sends three £4.50 SMS messages. Doesn't tell you it's going to do that, but it does. So you've, you've just downloaded Angry Birds and you think, well, great, it's free from this website, cool. Next thing you do, you look on your bill. Three, four pound fifty premium rate SMS messages. You realize what you've done. What do you think most people then do? Nothing. They'll probably uninstall that app. And this, is what might make, this is what we term a micro crime. They'll uninstall their app. They'll never go back to this store again. They'll realize what they've done and go, yeah, I've been got. But they won't phone up the, the, the cell provider and go, yeah, I, th this app that I downloaded illegally then sent four £4.50 messages. Uh, I want those four £4.50s back, please. They don't do that. They kick themselves and try not to do it again. Of course, most of them do. But um, So it's a microcrime. You know, these people make millions and millions and millions of pounds. When we looked more into this, this site, for instance, it's run by a, a Russian guy. Uh, now, out, now out of, I think it's the, the is it Bahamas or the Maldives, somewhere like that. Um, but he's making millions out of this site. And there's nothing people can do about it. You know, it's, it's, it's situated on that grey area of the internet where it's difficult to take these types of devices down. There's not the, the, you know, the level of intellectual property um, sort of blocking that you would see in, in most major countries. So he gets away with it. And all he's doing is taking pirate apps and doing SMS messages at the back end with them. Apple is not immune. As I say, there has only been eight. This is one of them. So this is 23rd of January this year. Um, there's one of the, the really good apps on an iPhone. It's thing called Camera Plus. Somebody managed somehow to upload a new version of that to the App Store that was malicious. So whether this... You know, and this is pure speculation, whether the development codes 
uh, of the developer had been stolen through some sort of malware attack and then used to upload the malicious version into the store or not, we don't know. And we'll never know. We can speculate, but we, we really don't know. This, again, Apple took this down in, you know, minutes after they found out. But this is an app installed on millions of machines, and most people click update all uh, when, they, when they look at their updates. So some people may have been infected by this. Jailbreaking, still very easy to do. Even though 5.1 is out and 80 security fixes in it to block most of these you know, jailbreaking attempts, it's one day later, something else out there. These guys must have a, 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 this queue of, of ways of manipulating the, the iPhones. That they, as soon as one, one of these things gets fixed by Apple, they've got another one waiting in the wings. And this happened again. The, the latest iPad 3, still no untethered jailbreak for them yet, but it will happen. I mentioned here the text messages. These were um, you know, a couple of things here. This was one on the BBC website last year, September last year, for, you know, about that £4.50. Uh, the, the messages off the phone. As I say, it's really only happening though on Android. We don't really see this as too much of a problem on uh, non-jailbroken apples. We do see this problem on jailbroken uh, Apple devices through the Cydia web store occasionally. So how then does WebSense find these things? So we have a thing called the ThreatSeeker network. So the ThreatSeeker network takes in the you know, two and a half billion URLs a day uh, that we see through all of our email customers. Um, we then have something in the region of two to three billion pieces of information uh, coming to us from our customers that uh, have all our on-premise technology. We see, again, three to four billion other pieces um, from our, host, uh, our SaaS web security solution. So we're seeing all, a lot of this stuff in real time. We're seeing the APK files, people are downloading those things and we're, we're doing automatic analysis of those to find out which ones you know, are malicious. And then adding the hashes into uh, hash lookup tables to, to speed those things up afterwards. One of the more interesting places that we see stuff from as well is Facebook. So last year we announced our partnership with Facebook. So if you put a URL in Facebook now, Facebook will actually run that past WebSense's technology to see if it's malicious or not. Now, let's give you a sense of scale here of now how many pieces of information I'm seeing. On average per day, I see around 66 billion URL lookups from Facebook. That's a lot of information. And it's a very interesting place to be because I can now see every URL that's ever, been, that's ever put into Facebook. And because this is where so much of the internet and people are today, it gives me this whole different view on the way that the internet works. WebSense has always been a corporate company, always selling to corporates. We don't have home user solutions. So we have no idea where home users go. What this shows us is where the world is going. And it shows us those viral outbreaks very quickly. It allows us to track things like viral videos. So we know those videos that you know, are being shared a million times in a minute across the Facebook platform. Uh, and we use that to power a lot of the categories and things that we provide our customers, like the viral video category. Um, so we know where people are going. Um, and knowing where people are going you know, is very key when trying to detect malware. Because there is absolutely no point in having some best of breed little piece of malware uh, on a website that nobody ever goes to. Because what's the point in that? The best malware is the p things that gets inserted onto the biggest websites and has the biggest attack vector. Facebook being the biggest of them. Uh, and Facebook know that this is a problem, so this is the, one of the reasons why they partnered with WebSense was to, to mitigate that problem as much as we can. So when you merge all that stuff together, we see uniquely about three to five billion URLs a day worldwide. So that shows you how big the internet is. It's about three to five you know, billion uh, pages or web lookups a day uh, across the world. Um, and because we're seeing the internet the way we're seeing it, we believe that, that we can then find that malware and detect it much, much faster than anybody else. And again, this is particularly key you know, for these devices because ultimately, you know, what does malware do these days? It steals your data. There's, you know, long gone are the days of you know, some little message coming up on the screen going, hello world, I've hacked you. you know, it's not about the, sort of the virtual graffiti type of thing that malware used to be. It's all about your data now, because your data is worth something to someone somewhere. And they need to be able to get that data, get it out of your environment, and then get it uh, onto some black market and sell it. 
because it is worth money. Whether it be your own personal details, whether it be your company's uh, intellectual property, um, credit card information, all of those things, they all have value. Uh, and, and it's not just about credit cards and things like that, that have the obvious monetary value. So let's look at some of the predictions uh, that we've got for 2012. So social media accounts and targeting attacks will be the single biggest problem this year. So we will see malware spread through them and we will see people get infected by them. But also social media makes targeted attacks against people so much easier. So we talk about APTs and it's a, it's a term that is thrown about by every security company like you wouldn't believe. You know, does anyone here really know what an APT is? Basically, it's a piece of unique malware that has been targeted at a specific user or small group of users. And it may use techniques that are well known, it's, not, it's nothing special. I mean, if you look at the, the APT that hit Google, it had been a piece of malware that had been out for three years. They just didn't happen to have a, you know, a, a copy of Internet Explorer that had actually been um, patched enough, which is how it got into Google China. But the social media accounts allow you to target people in a very specific way. How many people have a LinkedIn account? Most of us, it's probably most, about 90% of us now. Most of us probably have a Facebook account as well. Although, you know, those of us that are a little older may think, you know, well, ah, it's Facebook, well, why am I on here? But we probably do. Even if it's for secretly looking at what our kids are up to. <coughs> Not that we would ever do that. Um, but the, the amount of data that we tend to put on these websites makes attacking us from a psychological, psychological perspective very easy to do. You know, we're sharing with the world who we are, what we like, what we do. Therefore, I can take a person, find them on LinkedIn, probably find them on Facebook as well, and actually work out the best way to attack that person. What's that person's likes? Oh, that person's single. Maybe I'll you know, try and attack uh, you know, from a member of the opposite sex you know, make it look like I'm, 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 I'm some uh, person that they'd want to speak to. And, and by building up this type of relationship, it's, it's very quick to then be able to affect that person. You know, do I see that that person is a high flyer and just constantly sort of climbing up the ladder quickly? Well, those types of people like to make a buck quickly. So with those people, I, I would probably target a more financial um, type of transaction against them and put the demands on them to make that decision quickly. If you don't do this, this is going away. You know, when you do that type of thing to somebody, their guard drops. Because it's just like advertising. You know, you're playing on these psychological aspects to, to make people do something that if they actually stop to think about it, they never would. But if you can make them not think about it, they do it. And we always say there's always this sort of 3% of people uh, in the organization that do this. Now, unfortunately, it's a different 3% of people every single attack that comes out. Otherwise, we could just get rid of that 3% of people, hire other people in, and we'd be okay. And it happens to everybody in the end. We all fall for these things. So the less information about ourselves online, the better. But of course, we're all being encouraged to put as much information and be as public as possible all the time. Mobile attacks absolutely will start in their droves. They already are now. Um, they know that there is a lot of corporate data on these things, so let's attack them. And the internet is going SSL, whether we like it or not. And with data in motion, you need to be able to see the traffic. And if it's encrypted and you don't know the keys, you've got, you can't really do, even, even a brute force attack takes so long, you, you wouldn't do it. Um, so SSL traffic is beginning to create a massive blind spot where malware is concerned. Um, and what, because what we're seeing now is that in the years gone by, what would happen even with an SSL website, the actual attack code may be on the SSL, the actual attack sort of like iframe would be on the SSL website, <laughs> but it would redirect to another web server over HTTP, not HTTPS, because you didn't want to get the domain, uh, the domain browser mismatch error up on the screen, because a, a true drive-by download won't pop anything up. You don't know it's happened. So it would be off HTTP and would still be able to detect that. But because websites are so easily attacked these days, they're not only putting that little malicious piece of JavaScript or whatever it is on there, they're putting the attack code on there as well, all under the same HTTPS certificate. So it makes the detection of that stuff very, very difficult to do unless you've got some form of man in the middle attack uh, to be able to do that. And because of that, certainly the way that we see it, containment is the new prevention. So 
we can try and block as much as we can. And believe me, whatever any security te company tells you, nobody can detect 100% of malware. You'll see this absolute BS thing. We detect 100% of known malware. It's not worth the paper it's written on. It's all the unknown stuff that gets you. You'd expect them to detect everything they've seen before. Great. It's what, what about the stuff they haven't seen before? And with that in mind, what we then need to be able to do is make sure that, okay, if something gets in, something better not be able to get out. You know, so when we need to analyze that traffic and go, yeah, why have I got this link suddenly going out to Brazil? I've got no business in Brazil. I've got no websites that my users go to there. And I'm seeing this strangely encrypted HTTPS session going to Brazil using technologies and techniques that aren't even part of the RFC. That's malware. So you need to be able to de detect these types of things and contain them because it's not as big a risk. OK, I know that machine is now infected. I can go and do my clear up. I might not know what's infected it. And, I, and the choice may be just nuke it. But at least I know, and at least my data didn't get out. And then, of course, you have the, the, probably the two biggest things in the Western world this year, uh, the Olympics and the US presidential election. The amount of malware that will go around through these things is ridiculous. We're already seeing you know, fake sites being set up to sell Olympic tickets, um, all of those types of things that will, will, will give, you know, not only download malware, but it will also um, you know, steal people's credit card information, those types of things. There'll be, a, you know, people's need and want for information around the Olympics time is going to raise to quite a crescendo. And because of that need and that want for information, again, psychological aspects come into play here. People will drop their guard. You know, if somebody receives an email going, oh, we've, we've seen these amazing pictures um, at the London Olympics of, this, of, a, of a medal ceremony that went wrong. And please open this PDF to see the pictures. People go, oh, click, bang. That, this is going to happen. So we better have in place you know, a lot of good information. Because again, sometimes this not only comes down to security products you deploy, but it also comes down to the education of your end users. You, know, you need to start educating your end users about these types of things happening. So they are aware that they may see something during this time and to be aware that this is how they're going to try to trick you to, to open these things. So the more education we give people, the more knowledge they have, the less likely they are to actually click on these things. And of course, the US presidential election uh, will be big news uh, over in the US uh, and probably around the world. Um, so that, that we'll see a, a similar amount of things uh, for that as well. So that's the end of the presentation. Anybody, any questions?